memory is especially important for the Jewish people, particularly because it is such a central factor in the formation of our identity. On International Holocaust Remembrance Day, we of course first and foremost pay homage to the memory of the millions murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators, particularly those of our brothers and sisters killed al Kiddush Hashem, martyrs for their Jewishness. However, beyond memory is memorialization. For Jewish tradition, memorialization is drawing on memory as inspiration. We are about to listen to a series of videos that was screened last year at the virtual global forum, marking the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. These are personal reflections of survivors and the children and grandchildren of survivors. What I believe is most remarkable about them is not just the moving stories, but the fact that the presenters are all deeply involved in contemporary Jewish life either as professionals or in lay leadership. And that precisely the memories they share with us serve as their inspiration in this regard. In other words, they personify the idea of memorialization, drawing on memory to inspire their contemporary Jewish commitment and activism. Indeed, AJC's very work honors the memory of the victims of the Shoah in ensuring a vital and creative Jewish continuity and protecting a free society in which diversity can flourish and the dignity of all human persons is respected, thus preventing the catastrophic consequences of bigotry that reach their terrible zenith in the Shoah. May these videos help inspire us all to live for that which so many died for. My name is Julian Kleiner. I am a Holocaust survivor. My story can be summarized as follows. The Nazis looked for me, but didn't find me. Be it luck or destiny, those that searched for Jews didn't discover me. That is why I survived. I was born in the coastal town of Ostend, Belgium in 1939. Because my parents were Belgian citizens, unlike many foreign Jews and stateless Jews in Belgium, we were only forced to leave Ostend in October 1942. Only much later did I realize that by then, the Nazis had already rounded up thousands of Jews and sent them to their deaths. We ended up in Brussels, my parents went into hiding and I was given to a family of Gentiles. For two years, we were forced to be apart, we were, but we were actually living only two blocks away from each other. This picture was taken in the streets of Brussels in um, October 43. Brussels was liberated on the evening of September 3rd, 1944. I was thankfully immediately reunited with my parents. My mother had two brothers who left Belgium in 1940 and served in the American army. These two uncles settled in America after the war. We stayed in Belgium. But my son later moved to Israel where he has a wife and my two granddaughters who by now are both married. And I am now even a great grandfather, thanks to wonderful Lia Eli, born in November. Thankfully, my Jewish continuity has been safeguarded through them. There is a famous saying that the pessimists from Europe went to America, while the optimists went to Auschwitz. We were spared the fate of the quote unquote optimists. Today, I'm here to say that never again is not a certainty, but it is surely an obligation. My name is Harriet Schleifer. 
My parents were Holocaust survivors from Poland. Most of their immediate family and relatives were murdered in Treblinka. My father was the sole survivor of his family. He was 20 years old when Germany invaded Poland. He was sent from the large, then the Kleine ghetto to a munitions factory slave labor camp. He was a kind and courageous man who did whatever he could to help others. After he died, a woman I had never met contacted me. She said, I want to tell you that if not for your father, I would have died. He snuck out of the ghetto and risked his life to get me medicine. I was on the verge of death. In the munitions factory, he also secretly sabotaged machinery. My mother was married to someone else before the war. She lost everyone except her brother. My father and mother knew each other as children and ended up together in the slave labor camp as a couple. After the war, they came to America. Here they made happy lives from nothing, raising my sister and me with a deep sense of gratitude. My mother once said, Harriet, life can be so beautiful. My jaw dropped. This from someone who squeezed her mother's hand on the selection line just before they were separated and lost four brothers in the Treblinka uprising. I always strive to fill the holes in my parents' lives. I wanted to make sure that no harm ever came to them again, that they would never again be victims or feel fear. That drive created a strong Jewish identity to my very core. It made me a lifelong Jewish advocate. I want to help ensure that Jewish peoplehood and Jewish identity thrive around the world, that the victims of the Shoah, including so many of my family, did not die in vain. Today, I am here to say that no one should ever have to hide their Jewish identity. All human beings deserve dignity and respect. We must protect Jews. We must protect all vulnerable communities. We must build bridges and join hands so that no one is ever attacked simply for who they are. AJC is my vehicle through which I pursue these goals. As global Jewish advocates, we speak up, we speak out and we must, as my parents taught me. My name is Eric Adamson. My grandfather was born in Königsberg, Germany, then the capital of East Prussia. Today, it's known as Kaliningrad in Russia. In 1933, after my grandfather's father died, he moved to Frankfurt Oder with his mother and sister. There, he attended a public school but often on the way home, he was taunted by his classmates being called Judenjunge, or Jew boy in English. He was eventually expelled from the school for being Jewish, at which point his parents sent him to Berlin to live in a Jewish home for children and students who were also living far away from their parents. He was also bar mitzvahed in Berlin, but in 1938, as his situation continued to deteriorate, he hopped on the kinder transport to Westgate, England, and he lived with a family who was sheltering other Jewish children. During the war, he was living in London and worked in a factory building bombers for the British Royal Air Force. After the war, he enlisted in the 9th US Air Force Division, working as an interpreter and a special investigator into Nazi crimes. He was also used as an interpreter when the camps in Mauthausen, Austria, were liberated, one of the most infamous Nazi camps. There, he saw the horrors that the Nazis had inflicted on the Jewish people. In 1949, he went to the US to start a new life. Today, I work for AJC in Berlin, the city my grandfather once fled, to ensure that Jewish life can have a vibrant future in Germany and Europe, a life my grandfather was denied. My name is Steve Zelkowitz. My parents, two Holocaust survivors, were born and raised in Częstochowa, Poland. Before the war, Częstochowa had 40,000 Jewish residents, of which only 10% survived the Holocaust. Among those lost were my grandparents, six aunts and uncles, and numerous first cousins, whose names I do not and will never know. My father was an officer in the Polish army 
who survived the German invasion of Poland in 1939 and ultimately was captured, abused, and imprisoned by the Soviets. My mother acquired false papers and lived as a practicing Catholic in Warsaw. They became reacquainted after the war and left Poland in 1946, where they spent two years in a displaced persons camp in Germany, a place with many other survivors who had no other place to go. Finally, in 1948, they received permission to emigrate to the United States, and I was born a year later. I cannot and will not be a bystander while anti-Semitism grows in Europe, the United States, and elsewhere. We must stand tall and proud, speak up, and link arms. My name is Edith Chaffetz. My parents, Tasha and Moshka Jakubowicz, were Holocaust survivors from Poland. As a child, I eavesdropped late at night as my parents des described horrific stories of their Shoah experiences, as well as those they loved who never returned. Those memories haunt me to this day. My mother was from the town of Zarwierza. She was the third of five children, the sick one, but always bold. She attempted to save her family by presenting herself at the Umschlagplatz, the railway station, for deportation to give her family time to find hiding places. When she returned home after the war, she learned that none of them, not one, had survived. My father was from Częstochowa. He had been married with two young sons before the war. When he was liberated, he returned to learn that his wife and children were among the six million. He never spoke of them to me, but his anguish and pain was evident throughout his short life. After the war, they met in Częstochowa, where many survivors, scarred and scared, found one another. From there, they left for Germany. Deadly pogroms were being committed again, and they were terrified. I was born in Bavaria, where we awaited our visas for America. Three years later, we arrived in the United States and ended up in Worcester, Massachusetts. While some survivors were able to create optimistic, happy homes, we were not one of them. My father and mother were battered and broken. Their happiest times were late at night when they sat with other survivors reminiscing about their lives prior to the Milichoma, the war. Six years ago, my mother passed away. She was so valiant in her death. While her life was tragic, she was eager and happy, believing that she would be reunited with those she missed so much. She could never forgive herself for living. My greatest regret is that I never had the courage to ask the questions that nag at me. I will never know. The Holocaust is, at best, especially for young people, just a word. A word that means so much to those of us who remember and did not forget. We must stand up for those sacred memories and remembrances. Today I proclaim that I will continue to fight against anti-Semitism. Keep the promise of never forgetting and speak out that the state of Israel is essential to ensuring the safety and security of the Jewish people. Am Yisrael Chai. My name is Lily Platt. I was born in a displaced persons camp in Feldafing, Germany in 1948 to Holocaust survivors from Poland. My father was from Ludz, my mother from a small shtetl. My mother grew up surrounded by anti-Semitism. She was constantly taunted at school and wasn't allowed to speak Yiddish outside the home. In, in spite of her terrible reality, she was part of a large and happy family. She was sent to the first concentration camp at about age 14. Later, she was sent to several other camps, including Auschwitz. She survived starvation and torture, including a terrible beating by the infamous Joseph Mengele. At war's end, she was 17 with nowhere to go. She went to Prague with a girl she met in the camps, 
whose mother took her in. Eventually, her only surviving brother found her, and together they went to Germany, homeless. Soon after, she met and married my father, and they lived in the Feldefing DP camp. My father was the sole survivor of his family, including a wife and young daughter. All they wanted was to get out of the camp, to leave Germany and Europe. It was unimaginable for them to be living in a former German army barracks, surrounded by Germans, many of them ex-Nazis and sympathizers who were forced to help the refugees. After I was born, we spent another year in the camp. They wanted to go to Israel, but the wait was longer, so we came to America. They didn't know anyone and didn't speak any English. Thanks to the joint and highest, they were given a new life. American Jews met us at Ellis Island, brought us to a hotel and helped find an apartment, jobs, clothing. My mother called those organizations her mama and papa in America, ready to help with all our needs. My father never spoke of the war, so I don't know anything about his experience. However, my mother left an everlasting impression on my life and her story has shaped who I am today. My mother felt safe in America and she believed living here was the safest she would ever feel. Now anti-Semitism has reawakened in our country. The United States must always be a beacon of hope as it was for my parents and for me as a child. It was difficult to go to Israel after the war. Today, Jews around the world can choose Israel as their home. Israel's right to exist is not up for debate. And we at AJC will not stand by as some nations threaten the world's one and only Jewish state. My name is Belle Etra Yoeli. My grandmother, Ketty Yoeli, was a Holocaust survivor. Until she passed away when I was 16, I saw or spoke to her almost every day. She never discussed her wartime experiences. What little we did know was told to us by relatives. After she passed away, my desire to know more about her story continued to grow. In September 2018, two and a half years after submitting an inquiry to the U.S. Holocaust Museum, I received a file of about 50 documents. This is, most likely, her story. Ketty Benardou was born in Thessaloniki, Greece in 1922. Salonika, at the time, was one of the most important centers of Jewish life in Europe. More than 95% of the community, 95% was murdered during the Shoah. Because Ketty's parents were Italian nationals, they were able to flee to Athens, which was under Italian occupation at the time. But once Mussolini fell, the Nazis took over all of Greece, and Ketty was informed upon, captured, and deported to Auschwitz in May 1944. Both of her parents were murdered there. Toward the end of the war, with the advance of Soviet troops toward Poland, she was sent from Auschwitz on a death march to the Polish-German border. From there, she was transported in open cattle cars to Bergen-Belsen. And later on, she was sent further east to Buchenwald, where she was forced to work on Nazi aircraft parts. In April 1945, the camp surviving 429 women were deported to Theresienstadt. Ketty was liberated from Theresienstadt on May 8, 1945. At the war's end, she spent time in two displaced persons camps in Germany. There, she somehow found her brother, who had escaped capture and returned to Salonika together, but found nothing left from their past lives. To survive, she found a job playing piano in an officer's club in Athens. There she met my grandfather, Mayer, who made Aliyah from Lithuania when he was 22 years old and enlisted in the British Army as a doctor, a malaria specialist, serving in North Africa, Italy, and Greece. His entire family, aside from his sister, was also killed by the Nazis following the invasion of Kovno in 1941. My grandparents got married and moved to Palestine. And during the War of Independence, my grandfather succeeded in keeping the besieged city of Jerusalem disease-free. My father, Michael, was born shortly after the war in July 1949 in the newly created State of Israel. 
Unfortunately, my grandfather died before I was born and I did not get to know him. As a representative of the third generation and in memory of my grandparents and of all of my relatives who were murdered in the Holocaust, I'm here to say that we will protect the memory of the Holocaust and together we promise to continue building both a bright Jewish future and a better world. My name is Adam Hall. My father, Andy Hall, was born September 16, 1944, in a six by four foot cellar in Warsaw, Poland, right after the Warsaw Ghetto had been cleared in the middle of the Holocaust. Due to malnutrition, my father weighed two pounds at birth. He couldn't tolerate food, so my grandmother kept him alive by feeding him sugar water by teaspoon all day and all night. Without knowing whether it would help him or kill him, my grandmother also had to give him a direct blood infusion. Thankfully, the risk paid off, or I wouldn't be here, neither would he. It's unfathomable to think about a direct blood infusion without testing and typing today, but that's what they had to do. In August 1944, just before my father was born, the Polish citizens of Warsaw believed that the Russian troops were at their doorsteps and started an insurrection. It's known as the uprising. This failed and the Germans the Nazis decided to clear Warsaw. My grandfather took my family into the sewers to escape and managed to obtain passes on a hospital train to Krakow. My grandmother wrapped her face so that she couldn't speak and my grandfather had had surgery so he looked and could pass as a Nazi. By the war's end in 1946, my grandfather was able to repossess our family's pre-war home. Life wasn't back to normal though. However, my grandfather was, able, was named to a senior position in the Polish government, which he held until the communists took over. At that point, my grandfather, whose name was Edmund, was charged with treason and sentenced to a gulag for the rest of his life. A relative, drove my uncle, who was about 10 years old at the time, and my father, who was now two years old, to the Polish border. From there, they walked with other displaced children through Czechoslovakia and into Germany on their way to Palestine. They were traveling um, as orphans. They traveled from DP camp to DP camp for nine months. Most of this time, my uncle carried my father. My grandfather was able to escape the gulag. He found my grandmother and together they left Poland, spending months in search of my father and my uncle. My grandparents ended up in Munich where they saw my grandmother's cousin who was there to actually pick up my father and my uncle. They couldn't believe that they had seen uh, their cousin who was wearing uh, a uniform and he told them that he was there to pick up the kids. So by sheer coincidence, they were all in Munich at the same time. And my grandparents were able to find my uncle, find my father, and they were reunited. My father, who was two, as I indicated, didn't even recognize his parents. After a daunting process involving doctored Polish diplomatic papers, they emigrated to the United States and ultimately settled in Newburgh, New York for a period of years. Later, they moved to Miami, Florida, where um, my father lived the rest of his life. He died last year on his birthday, on his 75th birthday. My dad was a great man who never again wanted to be a victim. He could not and would not tolerate even the first step that may lead down that path. And he dedicated his career to that effort, his legal career. As my dad once said for Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust is more than a memory. It is a reminder. I am here today to say, as my father once did, that never again is not just a slogan. It is a way of life. It requires that all of us bear witness to the Holocaust and do everything in our power to prevent any anti-Semitic behavior, or for that matter, any other form of race 
or religious intolerance. It's just not acceptable. My name is Ruth Crawl. A close friend of mine who was actually one of the first babies born in Bergen-Belsen after it had been turned into a displaced persons camp has coined the phrase daughters of absence. This refers to daughters of Holocaust survivors who are absent family, sometimes all their family. I am not the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, but nonetheless, I am the daughter of absence. My father was one of 11 children born to an Orthodox Jewish family in Stanislaw, Poland. Two of my dad's much older brothers emigrated to the United States well before World War II. They would write home to Poland saying the streets were paved with gold. That happens not to have been the case for them or for many other Jews of their time, but it certainly was better than the reality of life back in Poland. So in 1931, my father chose to leave Stanislav and join his brothers in New York. He started out plucking chickens in Brooklyn, all the while corresponding with his family back in Poland. Over the next several years, his family grew steadily. The eight brothers and sisters back home all married and produced a total of 26 children. My father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather were alive as well. So if we do the math, a total of 44 of my father's immediate family were alive in Poland before the beginning of World War II. But soon after the war started, all correspondence from the family abruptly stopped. My father's last name was Fader. I was born at the end of 1945, and my earliest childhood memories are of other people with our same last name calling my father, and of watching my father frantically contacting other Faders in a fruitless effort to find even one family member, just one out of 44, who somehow escaped death. My father's two brothers in America had no children, and I'm an only child. Out of that enormous family tree, I am the only, I repeat, the only member of my generation. When you consider the sheer number of just the 26 in my generation alone, each of whom might have eventually produce two children. And then if you keep multiplying that out, you can't even comprehend the loss. It's staggering. It's unimaginable. My father never did find out what happened to his family. And my mother never allowed me to talk to him about any of this. She loved him deeply and she wanted to protect him from what was undoubtedly unbearable pain. On one, one of my many visits to Yad Vashem, I looked up the records of Stanislav, and I learned that the Jews of the town had been herded into the synagogue, and the building containing heaven only knows how many innocent souls was then burned to the ground. But is it possible that one of my relatives wasn't forced into that doomed building? Did a fader survive? Perhaps somewhere out there, I have some relatives. I don't know, and likely I never will. Al Fader died in 1993. Fittingly, his memorial service took place during the same week as the opening of the U.S. Holocaust Museum.
at every rite of passage for my kids and my grandkids, B'nai Mitzvot, weddings. My husband, Marty, always, always refers to how we celebrate the fact that our family is slowly multiplying, making up for what we have lost. I'm here to express my hope that my grandchildren and the family that they produce will forever be free to express their Jewish heritage, never afraid, always proud, in a nation that respects them and their place in the fabric of the beautiful patchwork quilt that is America. My name is Beverly Rosenbaum. I grew up thinking it was normal for mothers to wake up screaming from nightmares, not realizing how unique and troubling that was until I was old enough to understand what her nightmares were about. My mother, Margot Brenner Block, was born in Berlin in 1926. She was the oldest of three children in a close-knit, loving family. When she was just seven years old, Hitler came to power and her life changed dramatically as the rights of Jews in Germany steadily eroded. On November 9th, 1938, during Kristallnacht, her home and its attached fur store were almost destroyed. Her parents had been trying to obtain visas to get out of Germany, and after that night were even more desperate to do so. Sadly, they faced impossible quotas and closed doors. At age 14, my mother was taken from her grandparents' home in Poland, separated from the rest of her family, and sent to the concentration camps. She spent the next four years enduring unimaginable starvation, dehumanization, and brutality, working as a slave laborer in multiple camps. She held on to her, humani her humanity in whatever way she could through small acts of defiance. While working in a munitions factory, she deliberately put the incorrect amount of powder into the weapons she was making. During one of the selections, she was put on the line to go to the gas chambers. Miraculously, a female Nazi guard pulled her off the line saying, you look like one of us, you're too pretty to be a Jew. My mother was very beautiful with blonde hair and blue eyes. She responded, I am a Jew and I'm proud of it. I don't know which aspect of this story is more remarkable, the fact that she wasn't killed on the spot for saying this, or the fact that she had the courage to say this under such life and death circumstances. What kept my mother going was her unshakable belief that she would ultimately be reunited with her family after the war. After liberation, however, she learned that her entire family had been killed. 18 years old, she was completely alone in the world. Two years after the war, she emigrated to America, where she met my wonderful father, an American, who made her feel safe, loved, and secure again. I was their only child, and the three of us could not have been closer. Germany was a country that evoked profound anguish and pain for my parents. Neither of them could imagine ever setting foot there. So when I learned the HAC Global Forum was going to be held in Germany, I felt tremendously conflicted and wrestled with the decision of whether I could attend. I eventually came to the conclusion that it was not only okay for me to go, but it was important. With anti-Semitic incidents occurring in Germany and across Europe, this would have been a unique opportunity to stand together, more than 2,000 people strong, to advocate against anti-Semitism, to proudly show our, Jew our Jewish identity, and raise the voices that my mother's family did not have in the 1930s. Today, I'm here to say that I consider it a privilege and my responsibility to do all that I can to combat the alarming resurgence of anti-Semitism and to ensure Israel's security and rightful place in the world. Like my mother on the Nazi selection line, I will never be afraid to say I'm a proud Jew. I do this for my mother and her family because they did not have a voice. Fortunately, I do. My name is Fred Strober. My father was born in Brooklyn and drafted into the American army in May, 1941. He was assigned to an amphibious assault unit. 
which saw action from the very first moments of the landing in North Africa in November 1942 until VE Day, May of 1945. He and the men in his unit landed in North Africa, Sicily, Italy, and Normandy, all four invasions. By the time the invasions were over, of the 1,500 who had started in the unit, 400 had been killed or wounded. By 1945, as the war was ending, their unit was assigned to the First Army in Germany. On April 11, 1945, the First Army liberated Nordhausen. Nordhausen was a slave labor camp where the Nazis built V-2 missiles and where they enslaved and imprisoned Roma and Jews, among others. When my father and his colleagues liberated the camp, they saw firsthand the horrors of what Nazism was all about. Just three weeks later, in May 1945, my father, who had fought throughout the war and was wounded in the Battle of the Bulge, was among the first soldiers who returned home. It wasn't until 40 years later, when I was making a trip to Auschwitz, that he told me for the first time about what he had seen at Nordhausen. I'm proud to be a member of AJC, and I'm proud of the work that AJC has done over the years to create a reconciliation between Americans and Germans, and most particularly American Jews and the German people. AJC, through its efforts and the Transatlantic Partnership, works every day to create and enhance these bonds. And I think that the work that we are doing is making a better world and a better future for all of us. My name is Bini Gutmann. My grandparents all survived the Shoah. My paternal grandfather lived in a shtetl in Romania. Together with his family, he was deported to Auschwitz. His parents and one sister were killed. He and four siblings survived. He ended up in a displaced persons camp in Vienna and helped smuggle survivors to Palestine. His brother made Aliyah in 1948 and died fighting for the state of Israel during the War of Independence. My grandfather ended up staying in Vienna where he met my grandmother. Through him, I grew up with the stories from the war. My paternal grandmother was born in Vienna in 1930. She remembers the November pogroms of a synagogue burning down on November 10, 1938. To this day, she says, she can still recall the smell. Her father was deported to Dachau but miraculously got out. She and her parents left Austria for Shanghai. Other family members did not leave Vienna, as many of them were decorated soldiers during World War I. In fact, one of them went to Auschwitz with his Medal of Valor from World War II and um, World War I in hand. Her grandmother stayed in Shanghai until she was kicked out after the Chinese Revolution. She returned to Vienna and met my grandfather. My maternal grandfather was born in Krakow in 1939. When things became too dangerous, his family moved to Hungary. Once the Nazis invaded, he and his family were hidden, posing as Hungarian Christians. They all survived and also ended up in a DP camp in Vienna. Like my other grandfather, he too did not want to stay, but also never left Vienna. By the time my maternal grandmother was born in 1938, family had already fled from Austria to Belgium. She and her mother were arrested, but somehow she was released. Her mother was taken to Auschwitz and killed. Her grandmother made it to France and was hidden in Nice. Her father survived and they came also back to Austria after the war. My grandparents taught me that never again is not just an empty phrase. It means you must fight for what is right. Despite the horrors of the Shoah, there is vibrant young Jewish life in Europe. We are very much part of Europe. And although it's not always easy, we have won. We are growing and thriving, and that will never stop. We've just heard 12 incredibly powerful, personal, 
poignant stories across three generations regarding the Holocaust. I could add a 13th story as the son of two Holocaust survivors, but instead I thought that I would conclude this session by reading someone else's story, a story that has always appealed to me from a book called Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust. Permit me to read a shortened version of this story. It was a dark, cold night in the Yanovska road camp. Suddenly a stentorian voice pierced the air. You were all to evacuate the barracks immediately and report to the vacant lot. Pandemonium broke out. People pushed their way to the doors. In a panic-stricken stampede, the prisoners ran in the direction of the big open field. Exhausted, they reached that field. In the middle were two huge pits. Suddenly, with their last drop of energy, the inmates realized where they were rushing on that cursed dark night in Yanovska. Once more, the voice roared in the night. Each of you dogs who values his miserable life and wants to cling to it must jump over one of the pits and land on the other side. Those who miss will be shot. Even at the best of times, it would have been impossible to jump over the pits. Among the thousands of Jews on that field was the rabbi of Bluzhov, Rabbi Israel Spira. He was standing with a friend, a free thinker from a large Polish town whom the rabbi had met in the camp. A deep friendship had developed. Rabbi Spira, all of our efforts to jump over the pits will be in vain. We only entertain the Germans and their Ukrainian collaborators. Let's sit down in the pits and wait for the bullets to end our wretched existence. No, my friend, said the rabbi, man must obey the will of God. If it was decreed from heavens that pits be dug and we be commanded to jump, pits will be dug and jump we must. And if God forbid we fail and fall into the pits, we will reach the world of truth a second earlier. So my friend, we must jump. As they reached the pit, the rabbi closed his eyes and commanded in a powerful whisper, we are jumping. When they opened their eyes, they found themselves on the other side of the pit. Rabbi Spira, we are here, we are here, we are alive, the friend repeated over and over again. Rabbi Spira, for your sake, I am alive. Indeed, there must be a God in heaven. Tell me, Rabbi, how did you do it? Said the rabbi, I was holding on to the coattails of my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather of blessed memory. And his eyes searched the black skies above as he spoke. And tell me, my friend, how did you reach the other side of the pit? Rabbi, I was holding on to you. Ladies and gentlemen, in a very different way perhaps than in that dark field in Yanovska, we Jews are holding on to one another. We people of goodwill are holding on to one another. We need one another. We draw strength from each other. We draw inspiration from each other. And this Holocaust Remembrance Day should be a, a reminder of our interdependence. For me, on this day and every day, I renew four pledges, pledges that I'd like to share with you. The first pledge is to remember the six million. Yes how they died, but also how they lived. For each of them had a life, dreams, hopes, family, aspirations, and yet also how they died, how they were murdered in a new alphabet from A for Auschwitz to Z for Zyklon B. Secondly, I pledge to combat Holocaust denial in all of its forms, efforts to rationalize the Holocaust, trivialize the Holocaust, minimize the Holocaust, uh, abuse the language of the Holocaust, and we see it around us each and every day. Thirdly, to remember the slippery slope of anti-Semitism. The Nazi era did not begin with Janowska, or Auschwitz, or Belzitz, or Babi Yar, or Treblinka. It ended with them. It began with words. It began with demonization and dehumanization of a people and gradually became the 
destruction of that people. We must stand guard against that slippery slope as anti-Semitism has re-emerged in our world and taken many forms in many places, including right here in the United States. And fourth, I remind myself every day of the blessing and the gift of Israel, an Israel that did not exist at this time, an Israel that had it existed during the war might have been a home and a haven to trap Jews in Europe who had no other place to go, an Israel that might have rescued Jews as it miraculously rescued Jews in Entebbe and so many other places. An Israel that is precious, that was no, was not created because of the Holocaust. And yet the Holocaust reminds us yet again of just how important that Jewish state is. Thank you for joining us on this very special day. We look forward to seeing you again in the American Jewish Committee family as we all hold on to one another. Mm -hmm.